right. Okay. Like, thanks, Sportsman's Direct, Motor Guide, and Fortune Avionics. I'm going to try to cover everything that will help you guys put more fish in the boat tonight. Everything that I'm doing is a jigging specific thing today, so hopefully it's uh, when everybody came ready to learn. So, first off, I'd like to start with the goal is to help you guys put more fish in the boat. Obviously, I see a lot of people doing things that I think I've struggled to learn with. Uh, caught on in the last couple of years and I could help spread it to all of you. <coughs> so we'll start with uh, the biggest thing here is you guys are jigging, you're fishing the river. It's the biggest thing is you know, the targeting fish on the bottom of the jig bite. You're not targeting fish four or five feet up. You're not targeting suspended fish. Fish are on the bottom of the river. They're getting off their spawn right now. They're, they're spawning right now. There's less current on the bottom of the river. So the fish are hugging the bottom pretty tight. They're fairly in there. It's, you know, see a lot of guys jigging and you're, you're lifting your rods four or five feet in the air, dropping it, lifting it, dropping it. I don't know if you're trying to snag fish. I don't know what the hell you're trying to do. <laughs> it drives me crazy. But one of the things, you know, I see a lot of guys out here early just being way too aggressive with it. Them fish are coming off their spawn. They're not really that active yet. You're putting a bait in front of their face. So it'd be like you chasing a piece of pizza in the morning. So you know what you, if it's not sitting in your fridge, you're not going to go running around the block to go get it. Same thing. Don't lift that rod. I mean, a good jig fisherman is conscious of where his jig is to the bottom. I don't want you to be lifting your jigs two, three feet up. Those fish aren't going to chase it that hard yet. A couple weeks into the season, later in the summer, when you're pulling them out of weeds, all that, yes, they will. But to start off, slower approach. The biggest thing, don't be sitting there looking like you're having a freaking seizure with both your arms. You need to knock that up. Go out there, conscious of the bottom, hit the bottom, tick. Feel it, lift it up a couple inches. Don't be afraid to swim it. You don't have to drop down and hit that bottom every time. You don't have to pound that bottom. That bottom, if you're on rocks or stuff, isn't going to trigger that much of a bite. The fish, it's coming past them. They got a tenth of a second to hit it or not hit it. So if you're out of the strike zone, you can pop over three, four fish possibly sitting tight in the pot. So stay within that four, five, six inches of the bottom early season by far. So any questions on any of that? As far as being over aggressive, being under aggressive, mm -hmm. you, relative to the bottom. The river. Yes. Just the Euphrates River, or does that include like the South Channel? All of the above. Early yeah. season, yeah. When fish, they're they're going to do their thing in the river. They're spawning. They're getting funneled up. <clears throat> it's the same thing will apply to either river. Well, the next big thing everybody asks is about rods. What rod do I use? What do I do? Well, how can I better my strategy, my technique, this, that, and the other? The best rods I've found to use, you can use any rod you want. You can catch a fish on a piece of string in your hand. Let's face it, it's not. We're not doing rocket science here. We're taking a piece of lead with a hook and throwing it down with some bait on it or something. The best rods I've found is you need a backbone. Detroit River, we got good fish. There's going to be a big fish down there this year again. It looks pretty good. There's a lot of big fish in the area. It's going to be a tremendous bite down there once we get this crazy ice out of the way. So I like a medium rod. It's got to have a backbone to it. Now, fast tip, whatever you want. It doesn't extra fast. As long as you can control that jig the way that you feel you should, not popping it, not flicking it, and there's a certain time of the season where that is relevant, you can do that, but you want to be floating that jig. I mean, not, you don't want to go crazy with it. So whatever rod you feel, you have better control of. Pick them up in the store, hit them off the ground, bend them a little bit. Don't just buy a rod and say, oh, you know, this, that, this rod sucks, that guy was wrong, that's not the way to do it. So, and length too. Everybody says, what length? What do I do? How do I do it? Well, you know what? It all, it all matters to your feel. To me, I got a bigger boat with a bigger motor. If I hook in the big fish, I got to cross over my motor in front, so I need a longer rod. 6.6 six is my go-to rod. It's always been a 6.6 six medium fast. But my preferred rod, just because I've always had the better boat with the bigger front. I got to swing over motors, come over the back. That allows me to reach out without bending over on safely in the boat. Nobody wants to fall in the water early season. It's a, Probably a ticket to the morgue, so no, I don't want to see anybody getting wheeled out in a coffin. Not a good thing. Um, you can go down to a five foot rod, whatever. I mean, if you're in the back of the boat and you want to fish tight to the boat, five foot rod. So, the biggest thing to look for is with your setup is you want something that you're comfortable with that you feel that you can work that jig with. Don't buy something that feels like a meat stick or doesn't feel good in your hand. You'll never, if you're not confident with your hands, you're not going to be confident catching fish your whole day shot. Any questions on any of that? Rod set up? Line. Line? I like a no stretch line. What you put on there for line, your pound preference, all that does not matter. 
best setup, you go from a no stretch line, high run 10 pound test uh, equivalent, whatever diameter it is, it depends from manufacturer to manufacturer. But you go from your no stretch line, you gotta have a ball bearing swivel. That's gonna, you're gonna get twists, things are gonna get twisted up down there. I love to have a fluorocarbon leader. Fluorocarbon is a little bit more nick resistant. You're gonna be bouncing off rocks, you're gonna be getting in snags, you're gonna be popping jigs off, you're gonna be retying. Last thing I need to worry about is a nick above that is gonna lose my next bite. I can't, can't have that happen. So, and I direct tie to the jig. I don't put snaps, it's a waste, you're gonna waste a nickel every time you do it. Well, you're gonna get snags, you're gonna beat up the bottom. It's, it's gonna happen. Anything else on rod set up or just a, there's guys that say they go direct from the uh, power pro straight to the jig. What's the advantage of the fluorocarbon and uh, the mini tri -rim? You can go power pro direct to a jig. If you get in a clear water bite, you're gonna catch less fish than a guy with a fluorocarbon leader. Your fluorocarbon is to go invisible. Less presence to you. If somebody put your car on a rope and told you to get in it, I don't think you'd get in it. But if you didn't see that rope, you'd get in it. So it's a comfort thing. Fish have eyes. They live on their eyes and their senses. So they're not going to make a stupid choice or they're going to try not to. All those, well, they're going to try and entice that stupid choice for them. It's a vision thing. So take away that. You can do Power Pro all day long or whatever right to it. Dingy, dirty water. I still wouldn't. It's just my setup, my setup. That's what I do. I 100% recommend do a leader. How long will leader? It doesn't matter as long as you not you want to be able to get the fish to the top of the water and be able to net it. If you go over six feet, you can't put it to your rod, it gets all goofy. You're looking for a disaster in the pool, your jig's gonna fling off your rod, you're not gonna be able to pull your fish up high enough to net it. So I mean it really depends on your rod. I always try to make my very first leader because you're gonna break off and snag. So when I go out there and my leader's fresh from the tip of my rod to where the jig would sit on the rod keeper or to the cork. Wherever I can keep it without the jig bouncing off well traveling and trying to find fish. Anything else? Finding fish. <laughs> I see a lot of people going into the packs. Everybody wants to pile in front of the run sun. Everybody wants to pile in front of the cow pasture. Everybody wants to leapfrog boats and pull in here, pull in there. So the guys, this is where everything that you've ever wanted to think about the thing that haunts you the most is wearing them fish. At least me, that's, I, I can't take it, I have to know. We have so much technology today, the chips, the books, the, the Navionics on your phone, whether it's on your phone or on your grab. You could go out there, if you don't know the lower river, you don't know the upper river, you can pull this chip up and look. And what I'm looking for is breaks, slow spots, anything that would slow current down, an inlet, a cut that comes in, a deeper hole in the middle of a shallow section, any of that, it's great. And it's all, it's all on these chips, the phone, anything you can do. I see so many people just go out there and you blindly jump into the middle of a group of boats and you're so mad that you can't get fish and you're off the drift by a hair or two. I mean, I'm fishing a hole with five other boats and I see people come in and, oh, what the hell are you doing? What are you doing? What's different? Well, I'm not doing anything different. We're, no fish are stacked in this hole. So you need to really pay attention to your mapping for one to figure out a spot before you just slide in there and try to beat it up understand what you're trying to beat up. Second of all, look at your grab. You're fishing directly underneath your boat. You're gonna see fish on the bottom. You wanna see them fish on the bottom. You're literally, you're not, it's not like you're pulling boards if you don't see fish, you're not gonna catch them. You're gonna see your fish that you're gonna catch. If you're running a decent grab, I'm fishing underneath it. If there's no fish there, you're wasting your time, man, get out. Don't be afraid to beat a different spot or even when you're driving your boat, I always have my eyes on my grab. You cannot beat being able to do two things at once in life. I mean, you're looking at your graph and driving your boat on plane, I'm not saying to not pay attention, please don't hit anybody, that'd be a terrible thing. Nobody wants to day with the boat. But pay attention to your graph. You will mark little blips on the bottom, little bumps, little things that aren't there. Come over them again slow. 90% of the time you get on a hot bite, you will probably be alone in that river. I can guarantee you. And then if somebody sees you getting fish, they're gonna pull in and one will go after another. If you're the first one there, you're going to have the day of your life. Mm -hmm. That's the way to find them. That's the only thing I can tell you about. Best way to find them. So, another problem I see is a lot of guys with their motors. Big thing, guys, their boat control. You guys, a lot of people worry about it. A lot of people aren't good at it. A lot of people are concerned about some of their motors. Um, I see people trying to oversteer or understeer. You worry about being vertical. You worry about all that stuff. I mean, I can tell you... You're gonna catch fish if you're vertical, 
or on a 45. You're better off being vertical. You're 100% better off being vertical at all times. If you're going to be on an angle, that angle better be going down current. Your boat will be further down than your line. That jig's skipping down, not scooting forward. You want to give them fish the least, quickest experience. It's a reaction strike you're going to get out of them fish if they're not feeding heavy. they got a split second to hit it or not hit it. So by being on a 45, you're taking that jig faster, faster. Their heads. It's the only way that I would say. I would never say to fish an angle going up. If you notice your lines are behind your boat and you're facing up current, start slipping back down. Today's motors are pretty advanced. There's a lot that I see people do. You worry about your speed control on it. You worry about your head disc, you know, where your head's at. If you get in a, a boat, you know, your motor, your speed, you're not worried. What we're doing is trying to do short bursts to keep up. Very rarely would be on steady unless you're out there in the nasty, you're doing 30 mile an hour winds, 40 mile an hour winds. What I always do is I take my motor and I set it to about a five setting right in the middle. I don't want to use too much power because I don't want to hit the motor and be over my jig because now I'll pull my jigs up current. I do not want to pull my jigs up current. I always want them coming down. I put it on the lowest setting, I get up, and you'll eventually get used to it. Your boat will pull itself above them jigs. If you got it on the low setting, your boat didn't rock it, it got there slowly. You can let off. You'll start bouncing, 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 your jigs will be in front of you again. That's fine. Don't be afraid to fish on a little bit of an angle. You're still going to catch fish. Come back up to it slow. Now, if you're in some nasty wind and all that and things aren't going good, constant. Your constant feature comes in huge. Put your motor on constant. Put it on three, four, five. You're going to have to adjust to the wind. Always want your head of your boat, wherever the motor is, it's on the back or the front, you want your motor into the wind. The first thing I do, I come off plane in the spot, come in there, sense the wind, look at a flag, look at anything that's on your boat. You want that motor into it. You don't want it on the side. So you're going to put it on the side, your guy in the back of the boat, your guy in the middle of the boat. You'll be vertical in the front or whoever's on the motor. Your guy in the side and your guy in the back, they're going to be all over the place because your boat's going to be sitting there doing this until you lock on. Quickest thing, you fly in there, set that motor, head into the wind, alter it to the wind and the speed and whatever's going on. Constant for a heavy wind, put it on five. If you start getting blown and beat real hard, well, your motor should be still ahead into the wind. Take your foot, roll it over that pedal, kick that speed up or quick turn your speed up for a couple of seconds. You're going to come back over your line, your vertical again, lean off your speed a little bit, and you'll feel that wind grab you, slide you back, and that's what, that's what you want. You don't want to be constantly shooting up wind too hard. It's, you're going to waste your time fishing with your jigs forward. Always fish them slipping down current or vertical. Any questions on boat control, motor, speed? Yeah, with your, uh, do you ever want to be trying to hovering over a hole or still, or you always want to be at a drift? There's spots that have no current or good eddies. When you look up, when you think you're jigging and you're doing awesome and you're vertical, and you look up and you go, oh wow, I haven't moved in 20 minutes. <laughs> That's where you can hover. You're not going to know you're hovering. You're not going to know what's happening. Once you know those spots, you'll, you'll slip in there. And them fish will sit right in there. That's slack water. That's what they're looking for. They need a break. They're not, nobody wants to run on a treadmill all day. Fish don't want to do it either. Any other questions, boat control? Or that answer your question? Uh, for yeah, yeah. Most part? Okay. Yeah, real good. That's another spot. Don't be afraid to jig a spoon in there. Slack current, Rapala, <coughs> spoon. Get out of the box, get out of the ordinary. So another thing everybody I think has a question about is jig size. What size jig do I jig and where do I jig it? You know that doesn't really matter. It's a ball of lead on a hook. You can jig a one ounce jig, you can jig a quarter ounce jig. General rule of thumb, the shallower you are, the lighter the jig. I like to <coughs> jig as light as I always can. Now granted, I'll fish spots in Detroit that are six feet deep with a five eighths ounce jig. It's a nasty, muddy bottom. I want to be able to feel that jig when it's sinking in. I don't want to be sinking into the mud. You'll never catch a fish underneath. You want to be able to, hey, I, I'm in that mud, I got to pull out. Those fish aren't going to dig their noses and root through there. I mean, they will, they'll, they'll, you might chase it, but the odds of catching a fish when they can't see the jig, slim to none. So it, the jig size it varies so much. I got a box full of them. I got them from a quarter ounce all the way up to an ounce. North of the bridge, rule of thumb, an ounce up, up up here. Detroit River, I don't think you'd ever have to go above five-eighths of an ounce if you're comfortable with your jigging. If you're not feeling bottom, if you're not feeling contact, go heavier. The best thing you need to do is know where the bottom is, so that's very important. 
don't worry about your jig size, it's too heavy, the fish aren't going to inhale it. Worry more about feeling that bottom and knowing where you're at. That'll pay dividends down the fish you're going to put in the bowl. Any questions on jig size? Color? There we have the color thing. Everybody likes to talk about the color. It doesn't matter. Bright days, bright colors, dark days, dark colors, dark water, dark colors. If you could read a book, we could go 100 ways from Sunday from this conversation. Um, plastics, bait, live bait, early season, use live bait. Don't cut yourself short. They use some scent. They got some great scent, juiced up baits. You can't go wrong with the product. If you can't get good shiners, which a lot of problems we usually have early season, a lot of the shiners seem to be sold out. A lot of times it could be a minnow bite. It could be the head of a minnow on there, just a little bit of scent. We can't get that, we'll come in here, we'll get the juiced up bait and all that. Any type of stink on there, scent is not going to hurt your jigging technique and it's only going to help you. When fish are finicky, they got a split second to kind of hit it. You put a little scent in there, get a whiff before they see it, it's, hey, game on. I want that. So don't be afraid to use scents, don't be afraid to use live bait. So any questions on any of that? Plastics? Everybody has a special preferred plastic. I'm going to tell you again, it does not matter. Your colors, obviously, you got to do what you got to do. Swing either way, you got to swing. <coughs> Minnow baits seem to work better after it warms up. Your finesses, your angler's choice, all of that. It's, it's a big changer in the game. Um, your worms, your wine dot worms, your traditional stuff, don't stray away from. Your, you know, your natural colors. If you are confused about colors, go out there and fish with your natural colors. You cannot go wrong with being natural. Water's dirty, go dark. But don't please don't stray away from plastics. There. You can't beat it. You want to bulk up that presentation early. You want a plastic. You want a minnow on there. Don't be afraid to make that bait look big. It's not going to hurt. You can put a whole plastic on there, a minnow. It's not going to hurt you at all. No. I think I've basically covered almost everything I want to cover to you guys about jigging. I mean, I didn't want to go too far into it. This is more of an early season thing. Late season that you could throw dice into the wind and hope for the best late season. Because some fish change. They're going to go into weeds. They're going to go here. They are going to get more aggressive. They will chase it four or five feet up. So are you better pulling harnesses? You better jigging? Do whatever makes you comfortable. Don't, but don't be afraid late season to start getting aggressive with some fish. That's when you're snapping and all that comes into play. Early season I see guys snapping jigs and I just shake my head. You're missing a lot. You're missing a lot of fish until third, fourth, fifth week of it when the water heats up and the fish get real aggressive. So early season, don't go out there. Don't go out there trying to the snag fish. It's not it's not gonna put more fish in the boat if you hook them under the chin. The only thing I'll tell you right now, you're gonna put a hundred more fish in the boat by actually fishing instead of being too aggressive with them fish. Biggest mistake I see out there. Guys get burned up. I only came across four, they're all snagged. I don't know what to tell you. They didn't put in front of their face long enough because they're gonna smoke it. The fish just spawn, they used all their energy, they have to eat. They don't have a choice. And they have to take every easy meal that's in front of their face. So, any questions on any of that stuff? Any, uh, yes? Okay, running a stinger hook off plastic. Yep. Should it be just floating or is it connected to the back of the plastic? You could go back and forth all day <coughs> with that. I love to float it. The theory okay. behind floating it is if that fish hits. Every fish's mouth works on suction. They don't just, it's not like they go up to it like us and have to put it in their mouth and bite it. Mm. As soon as they inhale, they create a vacuum and it goes towards their face. I like that stinger hook loose for one reason. If that plastic hits the side of their lip, I hope that that stinger hook gets sucked up in there somewhere. And that will drag across the tooth or whatever until it gets hooked. So some guys like it in the plastic, I like to float it. That could be your choice, whatever you want to do. I've seen it work both ways. I will tell you, you'll probably get more snags putting it in the tail of that bait. The tail of that bait will come down, slap sometimes, or get in a rock, so it'll get snagged. So I put my stinger off of the hook, I pinch it tight to the top, and I pull it up. My stinger's actually sitting upright off of my jig. Best way I found to rig it. Yes, Tom? Yeah, you got a preference on two, three inch, four inch stingers, or? It all depends to what bait I'm doing. I mean, I'll fish stingers on a hundred different baits, so I actually have a bunch of different sizes. You put it on a finesse, to a wind out, they're about the same size. I like it to sit right at the edge of the tail. That way, it'll, at the least, if they peck at the very back, it's still got a chance to swing in there. I don't like it longer than the plastic. Sometimes I feel like that plastic will keep that stinger from getting snagged. So it will cushion a bait, or if the bait rolls a little bit, the tail of that bait will keep that jig out. So size of the hook, 
Some guys use tens, some guys use sixes. I'll use fours. I don't. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter to me. A size four hook, I have a way better chance of getting in that fish's face and putting some putting some meat behind that hook set. So mm -hmm. a lot of guys prefer eights. It seems to be standard. Some guys use tens. I would think a ten would be too small, but whenever you feel that you put more fish in the boat, I'll tell you right now, I put more fish in the boat off a of size four or a size six. Yes. With a wind out worm, do you feed it on all the way up to the jig head or just in the head of the wind out worm? The worm itself to the yeah. front of the jig? Yeah, I'll usually bite off a ring or two of it so it's nice flat and I push it all the way up to the jig head. I like to make it perfect, nice flat all the way through. That way when you are jigging, if the current does get behind it, it doesn't roll that worm. You want your baits, your plastics on. Whether you're putting a minnow on or you're putting a jig on, you want that to go as nice as you can across that presentation. Nice flat coming off the back, nice and smooth transition. Don't make it all boogery and curled up. <laughs> if it don't look good to you, it ain't, it's not good. So, same thing with the minnow. A lot of guys, you think you have to have live minnows out there, you have to be flipped around, hook them through the nose. Take that whole minnow, stuff that hook down its throat all the way to its back, bring it up. It's a piece of meat. It's, all, it's a piece of meat that the fish is going to hit for some. That doesn't have to be live, it doesn't have to be flipped around. They got split second to hit it or not hit it, so. Any other questions on any any jigging techniques specific? Okay, what about bulking up? Like if uh, in dirtier water, yep. you're using a finesse or a worm, yep. put another, uh, say, a shiner on top of that. Yep. Do not be afraid to bulk up your presentation by any means. In dirty Early water? Season, I always have a plastic on. Except for one jig, I'll fish with just a minnow. I'll put one minnow, I'll thread it on, I'll put another minnow right. down, snap it across its head, put it on there. You can put two, three minnows on. You can't really go too big. I mean, well, a lot of people, you go down to Erie, you fish, them fish are used to chasing bait balls down there. They don't chase one minnow. You go up to Saginaw, you fish a minnow head. You go down to Erie, vertical jigging, you're fishing three, four, five minnows on a hook. Them fish are used to chasing a big ball of bait and they're going to gobble up as many as they can when they come in there. That's why they're they have the bait up there to support the growth rate. That's what the fish need to do. So it's genetically in their system to eat like that. But don't be afraid. Dirty water, I, you're going to put the bait in front of their face. Balking up will help a little bit. Pull wire. That's my, that's yeah. my two cents. <laughs> so, anything else? You can kind of open the floor to questions, whatever you guys want to shoot off. Raise your hand, spit it out, whatever. Nothing? When you go to the fluorocarbon leader, do you use, like, when that breaks, do you, like, retie a brand new leader on it? Do you line the line now? No. That's the point of making it long. You want, I want to make my leader every day that I go out and have fresh leaders. As long as I can sport them, my rod with getting the fish to the surface. You're gonna break that leader. You're gonna snap jigs off. It's gonna happen. You're gonna donate some rods. Yeah. It's so small. Yeah. Right. Usually, that when you get snagged up, you'll break that line either at your knot or where it's rubbing across whatever you're snagged on. Feel it real quick. So a good floral carbon. You might have an abrasion or two on there, but hopefully nothing too high. Go ahead and retie. As long as you got a foot worth of it or two feet worth of it, you're fine. <clears throat> yes. Could you talk a little bit about the post season? Of the river and what is the migration pattern of the walleye from the Detroit River starting let's say May, mid-May, things like that. Where they go after May in the Detroit River? Yeah. I'm not really a biologist but I can tell you they come from everywhere. You look at the surveys, the tags, them fish come from everywhere. Those fish in 60 days could be as far as Lake Michigan, Green Bay, they could be up in the UP, they could be over by the Georgian Bay, the Canadian waters. They move, they boogie. Them fish come from everywhere. So the migration period, usually by mid-May, early May. A lot of your bigger fish are done. A lot of them are out. The males are still in there. You still got fish filtered in to do their thing. But um, as far as what you're going to target in the river, you're more or less looking for a bite. To target big fish that type time of the season, you're going to find some spawned out hens. You're going to find some better fish. But a lot of the big pods of big fish are going to be back out to their main basins, out to their lake, feeding heavy on shad and shiners and stuff like that so uh, the, the areas of target for mid-may or late may all that into june and the fish are going to start becoming more so resident fish that are sticking around that late in the summer 
you're going to find those fish are going to go into weed beds, they're going to go into structure, stuff like that. So you need to find find some good weeds, find a weed edge in the river, find some structure, any of that stuff, you're going to find fish. So a lot of the fish that are around though are going to be littler, they're going to be spawned out, their bellies are skinny and whatnot. So them fish will be out, Lake St. Clair will chase a pod of seven, eight pounders, two days they'll be gone, they'll be up on grindstone. It's just those fish, they boogie, there's no rhyme or reason behind it. Some, if it stays cold enough, they might stick around at the base there, but nine times out of ten they come in, they do their thing, and they're see you later, gone. Now, a good example would be Saginaw Bay. A fish, they tag fish up there when they spawn. Within eight days of their spawn, they're already out past the inner bay. They're gone. So, same thing down here. Those fish come from New York, Pennsylvania, all that, into Detroit River. Some fish come all the way from Lake Michigan up and around down to Detroit River, and they disperse. And they to tell you the honest truth, there's no rhyme or reason behind it besides they're chasing bait, chasing food. A fish could end up in two different spots, two different years. So, yep. We usually leave the river, Detroit River, when the silver bass come in. Yep. If they've been bad yeah. the last couple of years, they have to do something with them fish because it's going to get worse this year. Yeah, oh yeah, every year they're an uh, invasive species almost. Yeah, it's fun I mean, to catch, but need more people keeping them. Maybe get some of the rest of the others down. You can't even give them away now. So. No, I know you can't. Everybody's catching them. They're huge too, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. They're excellent smoked. I mean, you can't beat them. Yeah, I've never had them smoked. They are excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you can fish through them silvers to get your fish, but it's... And they've been coming <laughs> earlier and earlier every year. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we'll track them from out. When I fish Press Bay and the Michigan waters a lot, they'll come all the way from Ohio waters. You can track them all the way up the shoreline, and you know the days they're going to hit that river. This yeah. is amazing. The big, nasty school of them that comes is disgusting. It's invasive. <laughs> There's nothing you can do. You can try to fish past them. Yeah. They it's hit tough. Everything. Them walleye are still there, but it's tough. But they hit everything. They hit jigging. They hit trolling. Yep. I mean, you just... Yeah, there's nothing you could do. You could put down the biggest bait you got. Put down a reef runner that doesn't dive yeah. behind your antlion. They're, yeah, they're still going to smoke it. Yeah, they're still going to hit it. They're <laughs> timber polish. You catch two fish <laughs> in one bait. Isn't <laughs> that crazy? They're aggressive. They're invasive. They're not really invasive. They're, they're natural. But it's, there's nothing you can do to fish past the silver. <laughs> except for get burned up and try to get you grind your fish out. Put your head down on fish. Just catch them and use them for catfish. Baby. Yeah, there you go. It's good for the kids, though. Yeah, kids love Take it, Take them down near you. If you got a kid, you want to get them into fish and take them down the early season or late season when that's happening, they're going to have a ball. You know, plus the smallmouth that are in their spawn and everything else. The sheephead. It's a trophy sheephead down here. <laughs> Beauties. So. Anything else that you guys want to cover before you know it? Yes. Would, there, would I be at a disadvantage using a seven foot medium fast action pole? As long as you're comfortable with it, if that's what you feel, you have the best rod control over and jig control over and it feels good in your hand. It's just what I have at the moment. Yeah, no, you can catch, like I said, you can catch fish on a string out there. It's, uh, you're bouncing a piece of lead off the bottom. Yeah, just don't pull it over the head. But with a longer rod, though, you will pull, unless you're really concentrating, you got to figure that travel to the tip, just because you're two inches at your handle, it's put up at the tip, so. The shorter the rod, you will keep in control if you if you go wacky with it. Just try to keep conscious of your tip travel versus where your hands are. The longer the rod, the more the travel with this little snap of the wrist, too. So, But no, you're not at an advantage with any rod that you use. Just to try to target what feels good in your hand. To me, it's a 6-6 six, six medium fast. Somebody else might be a 7-7-6. Seven, seven, might be a 5-foot. So. Yes. It doesn't matter what real a rod, right? I mean, grand's pretty much. No, the same. no, not really. I mean, uh, I like St. Croix a parcel of St. Croix. There's a lot of good rods. So uh, a lot of your cheaper rods are good rods. I mean, let's face it, your jig it's only gonna last. If most people do it for a month. Nobody does it really all year. I, I like to jig all year. You catch fish all year jigging. You can do it. So um, anything. Last year, me and uh, my partner Jeff Manthor, we won the Detroit Michigan Walleye Tour. We did it with. Actually, the cheap uh, $40 rod that's back there by Hellbound. To me, that is has one of the best feels of the rod. Is it a cheap rod? Absolutely. But does it serve its purpose? Yes. So, I mean, a rod, you, could, you can get away with anything, whatever feels good. I mean, it doesn't have to be a $250 G Loomis. They're nice. They're awesome. 
It doesn't have to be. I like my St. Croix, but I'm not going to buy eight of them right now. They better have a house. Yeah. <laughs> or something to drive. Yeah. <laughs> so, any other questions? Open the floor, rest of the way. Yes. What part of the river do you like to target this spring? Early spring, I've actually fallen in love with the lower river. There's less people, the ramps are nicer, more secure. Lower Detroit. Once the crowd comes, once it gets warm, I like to come back and have a car. So I'll go to St. Clair. But the lower river, I really fall in love with. There's a lot of structure down there, there's a lot of breaks, there's a lot of different things. The upper river is nice, there's a lot of fish up there too. But to me, the lower river is more of a puzzle in my life right now that I really like to go down there, and that's, that's what relaxes me is finding fish on goofy, weird things. So. And I think there's bigger fish in the lower river early. I just, I do, not. there's not big fish all over the river. To me, the bigger targetable amounts last year and especially the year before were the lower half of the river for me. Not that there wasn't big fish up here in the mouth and big fish came out here in the spring and sat for a while. That lower river was on fire, it was ridiculous. There's another question. As the fish are moving out of the river, what's the best way to target them? Crawler harnesses. Pardon? Crawler harnesses. And once they move out in the lake and stuff and the water gets above 45 degrees, I'll switch to crawler harnesses. You can still get them on cranks and all that too, but once I can get out in the lake, I'm out in the lake. So once the big fish leave the river, I'm usually gone too. I, I like chasing them and trying to figure out where they're going. But you can still, you'll get a fish all year in the river. So if, you, if you're out there, you know, just meat fishing or whatever, you can keep jigging. Nothing wrong with it. To me, I like to chase them hens. I want to know where they're going. So Usually after they spawn, they spend a day or two in the river. They get out in the lake, and you can follow that. And it's usually by that time it's a crawler harness bite or a crankbait bite. You'll get them on board. Just tune it in your presentation. Speed. Speed specific. Your favorite crankbait? I got a lot of them, unfortunately. <laughs> you have boxes full of them in the basement. So they, all, they all have their time and place. I mean, the, from a flicker minnow to a reef runner, it's a huge difference. Two different actions, two different things. Uh, husky jerks, I mean, it all depends. Time of the year, too. Um, your smaller moving baits, like your flicker minnow and your flicker shads and your husky jerks and your smith licks are gonna catch more fish when the water's cold. They got a tighter wobble, they don't really throw off that big vibration. Not that they'll catch fish all year, but they their time to shine is when that water's cold. 40 degrees and below. Now, water gets warmer, your baits are a little wilder, you can pull faster, your hot and tots, your reef runners, all that. That's when they shine. They got more of a wobble. It's more of a, a target thing for them fish. They're chasing more. That's the time to use those. Don't really have a, they can't, and you can't be favoritism of that. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the walleye like way too many different baits to be favorite. So. Anything else? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like to conclude today. Um, we're throwing a tournament here. Jeff Van Torrey, Justin Clark, and everybody at Sportsman's Direct really put together a lot of uh, money and sponsors and got a lot of things going. We're going to do what's called Made Madness out of here. It's probably going to be one of the first bigger walleye tournaments with the payout wise since the PWT came here. Um, these guys pulled together some great sponsors. We're looking to get 50 boats for our first year. We want to kind of continue it. If you guys are interested in it, we're making it fun for a family. It's going to be a, uh, hopefully a good event. I don't know if anybody follows it, but it's more like the Hartman tournament that they throw up in Augres. So I think it's three man teams for the boat. Bring a kid with you. A youth is definitely encouraged to bring no dead fish penalty. Keep your fish. So it's not just a day of who can get the biggest fish. It's a day on the water with your family and friends. Maybe to the dad, it's going to be, hey, I'm going to try to win this thing and <laughs> show someone who's boss, but uh, that's just one of the things we're trying to promote through here. It's, uh, you guys feel like picking up a flyer, got them up here. Any the other information you want on your Navionics, your mapping, any of the stuff, your motor, I like Motor Guide Motors, I'm sponsored by them. I had been Dakotas, I've had terrible trouble with them, I'm not going to bad mouth the company. <laughs> <laughs> motor guides really a walk ahead of them by far especially this year they've had some setbacks so motor guide actually is going to shine this year anybody has any questions on it i have business cards here 
you want to take one, you want to try it out, you want to look at some of the Navionic stuff, don't be afraid to get a hold of me. That's what I'm here for. It's what keeps these guys happy and what keeps me doing what I like to do. So anybody has any questions, pamphlets are here, cards are here. You can always get a hold of me through the store. Any questions, what size motor, what's this? I got an electronic problem, this is wrong, what's it doing? Who should I call? That's what I'm here for. I'd like to conclude today. They got a. You guys have a giveaway. It's up to you guys how you want to give it away. No, you can do, do what you want. It. Do what you want. I don't know how to give stuff away. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope, unfortunately, the boat don't fit in it, so <laughs> it's not big enough. So, well, these guys came together with a jacket, so. Uh, Pick something from your seminar someone's got to remember and ask the question, and whoever gets it right gets it. I don't know why you put this on me. <laughs> She's getting paid to do today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. I got nothing right now. You got nothing. Draw the heat on me. <laughs> I have some other shirts and stuff. Whoever's interested in the motor guy or an avionics can come up and grab a shirt. <laughs> we'll, get that, we'll get that done with first. Right. Anybody, they're all, I think they're all extra large as they sent me. How about if they <laughs> name one of their custom colors? Yeah. How about the closest birthday to his? Yeah. Like a shop. There you go. There you, you go. already know what the answer is, don't no, you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. Yeah, how about that? Birthday. Yeah, Who's the closest to your birthday? Yeah. All right. Where's your birthday? <laughs> yeah, I can't tell you. <laughs> well, you know, the no, day. It's the closest one today. Day. Day. Closest day in the month. Day in the month. Oh, day. September 25th. I'm not here. Tiebreaker will be the year. September 27th. What's that? September 27th? That's my answer. Anybody argue that point? No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see the ID. <laughs>